There's this room at Hardy Correctional Institution in a building where religious services are held. It's a tiny room, maybe five by eight feet, a closet, really. But the inmates call it the war room. It's just where we do war, spiritual warfare. The walls are cinder block, painted prison gray. There are two stools to kneel on during prayer, and thin wooden strips line the walls where inmates can thumbtack prayer requests jotted on index cards. Leo finds himself in the war room one day in 2016, six years after his evidentiary hearing. Despite the fingerprint evidence linking Jeremy Scott to Michelle's murder, the judge denied Leo's motion for a new trial. Leo's now been in prison for 28 years, and he fears he'll never get out. And ever since his encounter with Jeremy Scott in the tunnel beneath the courthouse, Leo's been grappling with feelings he'd never known before. In the war room, he contemplates that moment and how he'd stood there, just feet away from Jeremy, ready to take justice into his own hands. I'd carried the wrongful mantle of the murder of my life for all them years, only to allow myself to be brought to a place where I could actually do it by this system. And I was feeling like a murderer. And I I didn't want that. When Jeremy's prints were found in Michelle's car, Leo's lawyer showed him everything they had on Jeremy, including his criminal history and his psychiatric reports. And in the process of going through all of that, I began learning Jeremy's story, because we all have a story, right? Mm-hmm. And, and his story is miserable. You know, it's, it's just a miserable story. Leo realizes that if Jeremy Scott is the person who killed Michelle, he isn't the monster he'd imagined. He'd done terrible things as a teenager, yes, but he was also a kid with a low IQ, serious behavioral problems, and a long history of abuse. Even knowing all this, Leo begins to worry that the anger that's building inside is going to destroy him. It was a bitterness that leads up to the war room. And I understood this. I'm a believer. And so from a spiritual sense... I believe that I'm saved. I know that my wife, Michelle, was saved. She was saved in a little church right up the road here in Mulberry. And so she's delivered. The only one that's losing in this thing right now is Jeremy, who's never known the love of a mother, never known the love of a friend, never had a friend. And he's in prison for crimes he's committed, and everybody hates him. He's got an 80 IQ. He has no support, no nothing. And I, I said to God, I said, okay. If this is your will, this is all I ask. Help me to forgive so that I can be free of that. Help me to forgive him. And then if you would, you forgive him and let him know love for the first time in his life ever. Leo writes his prayer for Jeremy on a note card and tacks it to the wall. Now, other inmates coming to the war room will see the card and pray for Jeremy, too. And uh, I didn't think nothing else of it. I came out of the war room and went about my day. But a few days later, Chrissy comes to visit Leo, and she's got news. Chrissy tells Leo that Jeremy Scott has just confessed to killing Michelle. Sorrow's depths are endless in this valley of tears. I wanna see a revelation. I wanna know who you are. I'm reaching out in desperation to the one. Who's 
Bone Valley. Chapter 7. I Lost It. Generally speaking, when you have someone who's been convicted of a crime, you have to move mountains to try and get that conviction overturned. This is criminal defense attorney Andrew Crawford. Scott Cup has now become Judge Scott Cup, and he's no longer permitted to represent Leo. Andrew read about Leo's case in a local newspaper, and he wanted to help, so he picks up where Scott Cup left off. With Leo out of legal options, Andrew knows the only way he can get Leo's case back into court is with, once again, the discovery of new evidence. So he starts writing letters to everyone who'd been housed with Jeremy Scott in prison, in case Jeremy had mentioned anything to them about Michelle Schofield. And he also writes to Jeremy. You know, by the time I wrote him the letter, I had nothing to lose. And I figured maybe he would say something. The letter that Andrew sent says, in part, I now represent Leo Schofield. If there is any further information you could provide me in helping to free this truly innocent man, I would greatly appreciate it. I await your response. Nearly a year passes. Then, in July of 2016, a letter arrives from Columbia Correctional Institution. It's from Jeremy. I was very surprised and I was very puzzled. I didn't think I'd hear anything from him because he hadn't really talked to anybody else. And then opening up and reading the letter, after reading the tone of the letter, I could tell that he had something that he wanted to, to say or something that he wanted to convey. What it was, I wasn't sure. And because of his extensive record, I wanted to be extremely cautious about it as well. Jeremy is being cagey in the letter. He tells Andrew he has information about the Schofield case that he's willing to die with. If he talks, he wants to know what's in it for him. He wants to talk to Andrew one-on-one. Andrew sets up a phone call a few weeks later. But in the state of Florida, it's illegal to record phone calls without the consent of all parties involved. So Andrew decides he needs someone to listen in on the conversation and take notes. He walks down the hall of his office building and knocks on the door of another lawyer. And he came into my office and he said, hey, man, I I got this call and I'd like to have someone present with me. I said, "Okay." you know, I didn't know anything about the case. This is Sean Costas. Sean practices family law. He's in the same building as Leo's lawyer, but he and Andrew don't really work together. I do zero criminal law, and I've never been asked to listen in on a call. So I grabbed my notepad and said, yeah, I'll be in there, no problem. So we got into his office, and I sat down at, you know, Andrew's desk. And he's got two chairs situated, you know, little executive chairs there. And I'm sitting in one. He just said, just listen up. Andrew puts the phone on speaker and makes the prearranged call to Columbia Correctional Institution. Jeremy picks up the phone. Jeremy got, you know, right to the point, like right off the bat. And I put it in quotes from my notes. It says, in quotes, got the wrong man in prison, end quote. And then he says, I was present when she died. And then Andrew asked who killed her. And then the guy says, it wasn't Leo. And then Andrew asked, you know who it was? And then he said, can't say it right now. And then as to Leo, he said, he does not deserve to be there. And then he said, I was present in the car. It was a rainy night. She was at a gas station. She gave me a ride. And then there was some hidden lake where she was murdered. And he also said, I was drugged up bad that night. And then Andrew asked him, what happened at this hidden lake? And then he said, he being Jeremy said, she was killed inside her car. There was no blood. And then he said there was a hunting knife or a compass knife. And then he said, they don't like me talking to lawyers around here. And then Andrew asked Jeremy, what happened when he got to the lake? And then he said, I lost it. I killed her. 
and then he said he would testify to it and that he was willing to take a polygraph test and then he said i'm sorry man and, th and that's the end of my notes you know my impression of of jeremy was that he wanted to like come clean about it and he was remorseful as i recall you know he was upset that someone else was in jail for a murder that he committed. Jeremy Scott had just given a detailed confession to the murder of Michelle Schofield. A confession like this should certainly qualify as new evidence, which could lead to a new trial for Leo, if not an outright dismissal of the charges against him. And there was one other thing Sean had in his notes. Did Jeremy say anything about a prosecutor? He did. There was um there was something. Yeah, here it is. It says prosecutor lied. But I didn't know what it meant. It didn't mean anything to me because I don't do any criminal law. But something about the prosecutor lied to him. We have a theory about what this means. We know that in 2005, Jeremy had been brought to Assistant State Attorney John Aguero's office. Jeremy and Aguero had spoken at length without anyone else present, and the meeting wasn't recorded. Before the evidentiary hearing in 2010, Aguero testified in a deposition that he wasn't alone in his office with Jeremy Scott. He said that the cold case detective who was investigating Jeremy had been there with him. But this detective had written in a report that he was on vacation that week, and his report clearly states that Aguero admitted to him that he brought Jeremy into his office while the detective was away. So Assistant State Attorney John Aguero lied, under oath, about this meeting with Jeremy Scott. But we don't think that's the lie Jeremy's talking about. We've always been curious about what exactly went on behind closed doors. Maybe Aguero told Jeremy to talk about stealing the stereo in a certain way. Maybe he helped Jeremy with his testimony for Leo's evidentiary hearing. Or maybe he promised Jeremy something in return and never followed through. And that's the lie Jeremy is talking about. Because Aguero didn't record the meeting or have anyone else present, Jeremy's the only other person who can say what happened behind that closed door. After Jeremy Scott confesses over the phone to the murder of Michelle Schofield, Leo's lawyer, Andrew Crawford, immediately prepares an affidavit, a written legal document that details what Jeremy had said on the phone call. All Jeremy has to do is sign it. Jeremy sent an affidavit back, which I was extremely puzzled by. It said no. He put, wrote the word no on it. We have copies of this affidavit. On the line where Jeremy was supposed to have signed his name are two big letters, N-O. Without a signed affidavit, Andrew knows he has to try something else. He wants to send a private investigator to talk to Jeremy Scott to get the confession on tape. Everything in my life is a home run or a failure, or you're getting there, you know, so it's, it's not never easy peasy. This is Pat McKenna. He's been a private investigator for 37 years, and he's been involved in some of the biggest criminal cases in Florida. If you recognize his name, it might be because of his work with clients like O.J. Simpson and Casey Anthony. After reading up on Leo's case, McKenna agrees to visit Jeremy. He drives to the prison where two corrections officers escort him into a meeting room. So two guys come get me, and they brought me into a room, and they stayed. I said, well, I really want to see this guy by myself. They said, oh, no, you can't see this guy by yourself. I said, why not? He said, this is a bad dude. He's in administration confinement or the shoe or something. I forget what his status was at that time. I said, I've seen, I've been in prisons all over this country and around the world. I've been in prisons. I've met with some of the most dastardly criminals you can imagine. I really would like to be alone with the guy. 
I said, can't happen. We will stand at the door, but the door stays open while you're doing this. I'm still frustrated because I'm thinking, this is not any good. I want to talk to this guy. And I, you never trust guards not to overhear and then mis, misstate what they just heard. But anyway, so I hear this clanging of chains, and I'm sitting facing the doorway, and here comes Jeremy. And they had him chained like Houdini couldn't have got out of this stuff. I mean, his wrists were chained to, to his belt. Chain came from the belt, chained down to the ankles. They were chained together, so he basically just shuffled and jingled. And what was interesting was I looked at him, and he's got a mask over his face, like a white gauze thing. But it was kind of like I was thinking Hannibal Lecter. This guy's got a mask on, but it wasn't like in the movie, but it was a full face mask. And I said, what's this all about? He said, well, he's a spitter. He'll spit all over everybody and fight and curse you and all that. And he comes in, he goes, who the fuck is this guy? I go, Jeremy, it's Pat McKenna. I'm a private investigator. I have a letter from it. And he stops. Take me out of here. I ain't talking to this guy. Corrections officers lead Jeremy out of the room. Pat McKenna doesn't get the recorded confession he'd hoped for. But still, Leo's lawyer, Andrew Crawford, has the notes from the phone call with Jeremy and the sworn witness statement from his colleague, Sean Costas. So Andrew files a motion with the court. He's hoping that, even without a taped confession, this will be enough to trigger a new hearing. Andrew also notifies the state attorney's office that Jeremy has confessed. They send two investigators to interview Jeremy at Columbia Correctional Institution, but they found out afterwards that their tape recorder had failed. So they try again. The state wants to get their own version of Jeremy's story. So it's Monday, March 13th, 2017. It's 1.31 p.m. at the state attorney's office in in the deposition room for um, Jeremy. I want to talk to you again, um, just basically about the same thing that we talked to you about before. The interview does not start well. Jeremy's upset. You want me to confess to everything on here, and that ain't what's going to happen like that. You know, ain't nobody trying to help me get out. Ain't nobody trying to help me get no deal. Ain't nobody trying to do nothing. Nobody trying to send me no money. Ain't nobody trying to do nothing. So why would I help somebody else? They ain't trying to help me. If you want me to confess something, pay me. If you don't want me to confess something, leave me alone. That's the way I swear it works. What do you mean pay you? I don't right. understand that. What I mean is, I told you before. The investigators try to get Jeremy to talk about what he told Andrew Crawford on the phone. Did you tell him anything that would make him believe that you were giving a confession? No. Nah. I don't make no confessions. Not unless I got, not unless you got something put in my hand. I mean, I ain't that crazy. I'm not, I know that much. Jeremy has been in prison for almost as long as Leo now, 27 years. His grandma, the only person he had contact with outside the prison, died in 2012. When my grandma passed away, I ain't got nothing else to do with this stuff. Ain't no sense going back to Polk County. And back then, if she was alive, I would, I would love to be here. Gotta get my visits. And now she did. I don't want to see nobody. At the time of this recording in 2017, Jeremy has no family contact, no visitations, no lawyers. He gets no letters and no phone calls from people on the outside. And he has no money in his canteen, which means he only eats what they're serving in the cafeteria. He can't buy anything like deodorant and can only use the state-issued soap and toothpaste. On top of that, he's constantly getting in trouble in prison and placed under increased security, similar to solitary confinement. It's a desolate place to be in, physically and psychologically. And now, Jeremy knows that he has information someone wants. It only makes sense that he would try to use it to his advantage. Maybe he can tell his story and get something out of it. Whatever the reason, Jeremy doesn't want to tell the investigators the same story he told Andrew. Instead, he returns to his previous story about how his fingerprints ended up in Michelle Schofield's Mazda. 
He says he used to steal from cars abandoned on I-4. Now, what you're talking about is when I was stealing the stereo system out of the cars. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. That's what you're talking about. When you're taking stereo systems out of cars, let's talk about that for a little bit. Is, is what, what, was, what were you doing? You, you brought it up. How many, how many cars did you take stereo systems out of? The investigators are pressing Jeremy for details. Who was he with? What car was he driving? What did he do with the stereo equipment he stole? Jeremy can't stick to one story. He's not sure who was with him. Might have been this guy Rambo. But probably it was his buddy Robert. Who was with you for that burglary? But then Jeremy starts telling the story like he was by himself. Almost like he forgot he said Robert was in the car with him. He tells them he was in his friend Cheryl's car. But in an earlier statement, he said he was in his girlfriend Jamie's car. You were in Cheryl's car? But there's one thing Jeremy does admit to telling Andrew Crawford on the phone. That's, that's what I'm trying to figure out here. So you ne- during that phone call, you never made any statements to facts of that case that would lead him to believe that you were confessing to the murder of Michelle Schofield? I said I don't believe he did it. That's one thing I remember saying. Jeremy says... I don't believe he did it. As in, I don't believe Leo Schofield did it. Which, of course, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why would Jeremy think that unless he knew something about the murder or he knew someone who did? Then, toward the end of their interview, just when they're wrapping up, Jeremy tells them this. But as far as Michelle, as far as this... Uh, cab driver and Gassimi and, and whoever else they trying to talk about, I don't know anything about it. Right out of the blue, totally unprompted, Jeremy brings up this cab driver. The investigators don't even know what to say. I don't know anything about a cab driver. Well, I, there's, there's a cab driver, uh, uh, some cab driver got shot in, in Gassimi. That's not related to the Schofield case. No, that's what I'm, I heard about it in prison. Okay. I heard my name. I don't. I don't know anything about Let's a cab driver. Let's keep it to this. I don't want to know anything. <laughs> Trust me. It sounds like Jeremy sort of laughs, says something like, "That's fine. Trust me." I spent a lot of time obsessing over why Jeremy would bring this up. This has to be the same cab driver murder that Jeremy casually confessed to three decades ago. The same murder he told his girlfriend, Jamie, that he'd gotten away with. The same murder we think Dan Odie was almost put to death for. And in 2017, this cab driver is still on Jeremy's mind. Is he trying to see if these investigators know about it? Or if the state is going to charge him? Or is it weighing on his mind, like Michelle's murder seemed to be? Regardless, The investigators completely blow off this mention of a cab driver. They just laugh it off. They didn't even bother to ask any follow-up questions. If they could have gotten Jeremy talking about the cabbie murder, maybe he would have come back around to talk about Michelle. Or they just might have left the deposition room with a confession to a 30-year-old unsolved murder. The investigators leave without any meaningful information about Jeremy's connection to Michelle Schofield and with no leads about Jeremy's possible connection to the murder of a cab driver. But what they do get from Jeremy was valuable. Jeremy had told the investigators he would confess to a murder if he was paid or if there was something in it for him. These kinds of statements cast doubt onto Jeremy's motives for confessing to Michelle Schofield's murder. Now the state can ignore the content of Jeremy's confession and attack his credibility instead. So, the investigators did have something to bring back to the state attorney. And this time, they managed to turn on the tape recorder. Andrew Crawford, Leo's lawyer, is hoping that a judge will grant Leo a new trial 
based on the evidence of Jeremy's phone call confession. An evidentiary hearing is granted and set for October 2017. It's just a couple weeks out when, out of the blue, Andrew receives another letter from Jeremy Scott. His spelling and punctuation make it a little tough to read, but this is what it says. Here's Andrew reading it. Dear Mr. Crawford, I would like to make a statement. I, Jeremy Lynn Scott, write this of my own free will. Mr. Schofield did not kill Mrs. Schofield. He didn't have anything to do with it. I, Jeremy Lynn Scott, killed Mrs. Schofield that night. I can tell you everything, what kind of knife it was, and how the cops picked me up, but let me go. I can tell you stuff where they found Mrs. Schofield, only the person that killed her would know. It's time to end all this. I won't talk to the state. They have made promises to me, but at the end it was all lies. You can hook me to that lie. That'll tell if you are lying or not. Everything I will tell will be the truth. Mr. Crawford, this is my statement in my own hand. Writing, spelling ain't too good. Hope to hear from you soon, Jeremy L. Scott. This letter, with Jeremy's signature at the bottom, signals something has changed. Andrew thinks this may be a sign that Jeremy is willing to talk. He asks Pat McKenna to go see Jeremy one more time. But what Andrew doesn't know is that Jeremy mailed out two more letters, one to the state attorney's office and one to the judge that had been assigned to Leo's upcoming hearing. The two letters are slightly different but they have the same general message. Jeremy says he is confessing to all murders in Polk County in the years 1987 and 1988, and he's asking to be left alone and put back on death row. Andrew had no way of knowing this yet, and neither did Pat McKenna, who was waiting to talk to Jeremy in an attorney room at the prison, just like last time. I hope they're not bringing this guy in, you know, just crazed or something. So in he walks, he's standing there, I'm sitting in a chair, and I remember just saying, man, you look a lot better than you did the last time I saw you. And he still won't sit down yet, but he sees on the table in front of me, I had laid out a letter from Andrew, the letter that Jeremy wrote, and I had tape recorder on, on the table too. And we got to talk, and I said, I just... I want to see if you'll talk to me about that case. He says, I don't need to. I told, I just told the judge yesterday and the prosecutors and everybody, I confessed to everything. I go, you confessed to everything? He said, yeah. Well, I didn't know he meant every murder that's ever happened in the county, just out of frustration, I guess. So I said, well, you know, we'll sit down. We start talking. I would introduce Jeremy Scott. Um, Jeremy, can you uh, raise your right hand? Uh, do you swear that everything you're going to tell me is the truth and the whole truth? Yes, sir. Okay. I was going to go through the whole all kinds of question and answers. I said, Jeremy. I just wanted you to go ahead and just explain what happened that night um, with Michelle. This word's overused, but it became surreal for me. His whole body started to change, right? He, he was twitching a little bit, and he just... He, quit looking at me and he looked right at my dictaphone, my tape recorder sitting right there. And he was leaning over it and I just, it was like he was unburdening himself or something. He was like talking just like a foot away from my dictaphone there and I'm just kind of watching him. So the early, early year 1987, I got released from prison not too long before I, I ran into Michelle. Apparently, we had met, according to her, at a party. It was around, around February, around midnight, maybe one, one o'clock in the morning or something, at a Texaco station. I've been out drinking, popping pills all night, partying. She asked me, was I waiting on the phone? And I said, no, I need a ride. I'm a little weary, drunk, but she said, I know you. I said, I don't know. And, but she asked me where I'm going. I said, I'm going North Coming Road. There's 
trailers, I'm known as sleeping trailers, you know, abandoned houses and stuff. So. Jeremy says that Michelle agrees to drive him to a trailer park on North Cumbie Road, just up the street. Really, she gave me a ride, pouring down rain, and I got my jacket on, you know. So we're going down North Cumbie Road. We go past. They pass the trailer park where Jeremy used to live with his grandparents. Now, Jeremy has another idea. You know, maybe I can get, get laid or something, I don't know. So I tell her to turn off in the road. It's, it's, it's a, behind the little trees is the lake, you know, and people go there all the time. When we get there, you know, she's talking about, ain't no, nobody lives here. I said, no, nah, this is where they, people come and make out there. Jeremy thinks maybe they'll have sex. But Michelle rejects his advances. She tells him she's married. You know, I'm married. I'm like, it's great, you know. And I went and reached in and grabbed my cigarettes and put out a joint. He says he reaches into his jacket to pull out a pack of cigarettes, and then a knife falls out of his pocket. Like a seven-inch knife, maybe. It's one of them hunting knives. Uh, it's uh, what you call uh, where at the end of the hand where it has uh, a thing where you knows if you're going east, west, north, or, or you know, some like compass. That. Yeah, yeah, yes. A little hunting knife, you know, not no big butcher knife, none of that stuff. A little, you know, uh, some. Michelle sees the knife. She she went to panic and started screaming, hitting, you know. And, um, you know, I, and then next thing I know, I, I lost it, you know. And, and next thing I know it, you know, I done, done stabbed her, you know. I don't know how many times, so, you know. And I'm, like, panicking now because I don't know what just happened. After he stabs her, Jeremy says he pauses, sits in the car, and has a smoke. I was sitting there for a few minutes in the car, and then it was raining outside, and I started smoking. Got out the car, went to the driver's side, open the door, drove over by the lake, held some plastic, trying to protect her from being eaten by the gators, snakes, or whatever, you know, and I slid her down. In the water. After he drags her body into the water, he says he gets back in the car. After that, I got in the car, went up to I 4. And I guess I stalled the car out. I pulled over to the side, got the knife, I got a towel, a white piece of towel that was in her car, driving, driving, you know, fingerprints off the car, steering wheel and stuff. Then Jeremy leaves the stalled-out car and walks up the exit to a little store. There's a, there's a dumpster and a, a little store. A store was closed. But I went up there, up the hill on the path. I threw the knife and the towel in there, in the trash, to make sure it was in, you know, in, deep in there. As Kelsey and I listened to this, to this description of Jeremy walking up a hill to this little store, we can't help but notice the similarities between this and what we'd heard from Leo about the night he found the Mazda. Jeremy's description is so similar to the way Leo describes walking up a hill to the closed gas station to call police. There was only one store off that exit back in 1987, which means that, if we believe both of these men's stories... Leo was tracing Jeremy's footsteps when he was searching for Michelle just 48 hours after her murder. And Leo might have been standing just feet away from the murder weapon that Jeremy had dropped in the dumpster there. Jeremy goes on. He says he starts walking back towards Lakeland when he sees the Mazda again on the side of the road. That's when I realize I, you know, I need a stereo system and... I took the speakers out and I and I wiped my fingerprints 
off the doors and stuff again. That's how my palm print got on the windshield inside the car. All I know is I went to the nearest trailer on Cumbie Road and I was passed out the next morning. Most of what Jeremy says matches what we know. Where Michelle's body was found and where the car was abandoned. The condition of the car having stalled out. The murder weapon, which was never recovered. The equalizer and the speakers that had been stolen. And the car must have been wiped down because Michelle's prints were never found by crime scene technicians. Michelle was found fully clothed and the medical examiner found no signs of sexual assault. And the medical examiner also documented scrapes on Michelle's back that were consistent with her body being dragged after she'd been killed. But Jeremy says a couple things that differ from what we know. Michelle's last known location was Sparky's, which is an Exxon station, not a Texaco. So he has the name of the gas station wrong. And if they met right after she made the call to Leo, it would have been closer to 10 o'clock, not midnight, as Jeremy says. But Jeremy also says he was drunk and high, so it's not a huge leap to assume he might not remember everything in perfect detail. But the general circumstances seem to line up. It was already dark out, and it was raining that night. And he says she was at a gas station payphone when he approached her the last place Michelle was seen alive when she called Leo and said she was on her way. Jeremy's detail about covering Michelle's body with plastic also differs from what we know. There are no plastic sheets or tarps listed in the evidence logs, and Jeremy doesn't mention the plywood that was covering her body. But Jeremy's motivation for covering the body which he says was to protect it from the alligators and snakes that might be in the water, this detail hints at one more thing we can corroborate, a sense of shame and remorse. I didn't mean to kill Michelle Schofield. I never intended to do any harm. My parents tonight when she started hitting on me, the knife fell out of my jacket. It was meant for nobody. You know, I live alone on the streets. I've been holding this confession for a long time. You know, I don't know what Leo is guilty of. If whatever the state said he did in other cases, I don't know. I do know he didn't murder his wife. He might have did other things to her, but he didn't kill her. I'm willing to take a line to take detector on this. And this is my statement. And I will say it again in a live courtroom. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. And that's the uh, end of this tape. You know, I come out of the jail and I'm as I'm walking out, I'm still thinking in my mind, holy shit, I can't believe this just happened. Can't wait to get out and call Andrew. I remember going out to my car and calling him up and said, uh, he just gave me a sworn tape confession of the murder. That was like the best day ever. It was the, this is this one, this time it's really it. Oh, this is it. When Chrissy, Leo's wife, first got the news that Jeremy Scott had confessed, she was flooded with emotion. As was Chrissy and Leo's daughter, Ashley. Yes, you heard that correctly. Chrissy and Leo have a daughter. We should probably back up for one second to tell you the story. After leaving her visit with Leo one weekend back in the spring of 2000, Chrissy got in her car and soon saw a woman she recognized walking on the side of the road. 
It was the girlfriend of another inmate. The weather was bad that day, and this woman was pregnant. So Chrissy, being Chrissy, pulled over and offered her a ride. On the drive, Chrissy learned this young woman was struggling. A few of her children were already in foster care, and the young woman wasn't ready to care for another. So that's when the Schofields stepped in. Chrissy first met Ashley the day after she was born, and Leo held her in his arms during visitation, just a few days later. At first, the adoption was informal. It took a few years for it to be finalized. But Ashley was Leo and Chrissy's from the start. Ashley is now in her early 20s. She says that, as a child, she was raised on this little patch of grass beside the visitation pavilion at Hardy Correctional. And that's where Ashley and Leo are sitting, on that same patch of grass, the day Chrissy delivers the news. And I said, Jeremy confessed. And we just, all three of us, just hugged and hugged and cried and cried and hugged. I couldn't do nothing but grab both of them and and, and hug them. I mean, the guy confessed. I mean, we have physical evidence. We have a confession with the detail. I felt like justice would finally, the system would finally work. I always believed that right would right itself somewhere. It can't be so bad and so corrupt that they keep letting this go on and on and on. So I told, I told Ashley. The daddy's coming home. This is it. It's over. The family starts getting ready for another day in court. Yep, here we go again. To prepare for the new hearing um, sounds easy. Like you just schedule a hearing and you go. But no, it takes months and months and months and months and months and months. Things are going to be a bit different at this hearing. For one, John Aguero, the assistant state attorney, he won't be there. John Aguero died suddenly in July of 2017 while visiting his daughter abroad in Morocco. So the prosecutor with the old sparky tie clasp, the one who was there the day they arrested Leo, the one who tried to pursue the death penalty in Leo's trial, even though he told Leo that he thought his father killed Michelle, the one who had the forensic evidence in Leo's case destroyed. This prosecutor, who played such a huge role in Leo's life the past 20-something years, he's gone. And in an odd turn of events, Leo finds himself mourning his prosecutor's death. I actually like John Guerrero. I felt, I felt, and listen, I I shouldn't say like, I may be wrong about this. I, I believed early on that he believed in what he was doing. Because the alternative is to think that he's doing it because I don't count. He doesn't care about justice. That's not a good proposition for me. So um, my fight was to prove my innocence and then hopefully one day show him. And in this fantasy I have him admitting he was wrong. And then we can go about being friends or at least associates. And uh, so when he died, a part of me died with him just because that opportunity is gone. And in my faith, he knows the truth now. You know, and, and I hope that him knowing that truth now is not a reason why he's not comfortable today. In John Aguero's last years as assistant state attorney, he ran into some legal troubles of his own. In 2011, he was arrested for domestic battery during an argument with his estranged wife. After his short retirement, the state attorney brought him back, not to try cases, but to mentor up-and-coming prosecutors. One of those he mentored is Victoria Avalon. She's now representing the state at Leo's evidentiary hearing. Basically, she's the new John Aguero. 
State v. Leo Schofield, 88 CF 2346A1. It's October 12th, 2017. Just over a week ago, Jeremy Scott gave a taped confession to the murder of Michelle Schofield. Leo and his attorneys gather in a Polk County courtroom to present the new evidence. A phone confession, the one he gave to Andrew and Sean, a written confession, the letter he sent to Andrew Crawford before the phone call, and now a taped confession. Mr. Schofield is entering the courtroom. Could we have appearances for the record, please? Sitting next to Leo is Andrew Crawford. Andrew Crawford, attorney for Mr. Schofield. And another attorney by the name of Seth Miller. Seth Miller, attorney for Mr. Schofield. Seth Miller works for the Innocence Project of Florida, and they're now representing Leo. Having the Innocence Project on your side can lend a lot of credibility in legal proceedings like this one. On the other side of the courtroom is Victoria Avalon, John Aguero's mentee. And seated beside her is Jerry Hill. Jerry Hill was Aguero's boss, and now he's Victoria Avalon's boss. Victoria Avalon and Jerry Hill are the last defenders of Aguero's legacy. Though, of course, as representatives of the state, their official job is to pursue justice for Michelle Schofield. Each side is given the opportunity to give an opening statement before the judge. Andrew Crawford goes first. Based on the fingerprints which forensically link Mr. Scott to the homicide, uh, as well as the subsequent admissions and confessions, I'd respectfully ask the court to grant Mr. Schofield a new trial. Andrew's opening is quick and to the point. He argues for less than three minutes. He's going to let the evidence speak for itself. But then Victoria Avalon stands, and her opening statement goes on for nearly an hour. Judge, this case doesn't really present you anything new factually other than the newly discovered evidence that they're putting on. Most all the facts that you are going to hear over the next couple of days has been debated endlessly for years. At its heart... Avalon's main point seems to be that Jeremy Scott is not a reliable witness, and therefore his confessions have no credibility. Mr. Scott isn't trustworthy, and I'll tell you why. Since the first time he's reached out to the defense in 2016, he's flip-flopped three times. Who knows what he'll say today? There's no doubt that Jeremy can be a difficult witness. It's true that Jeremy confessed to Leo's lawyers and then denied it when the state investigators came to see him. And Avalon is saying that because of that, nothing Jeremy says can be believed. The one thing that all of us in this room, I think, can agree on and will agree on is that Jeremy Scott is not a reliable witness. And then she also goes after Leo's credibility. Yes, this was a circumstantial case. But that does not mean that we got the wrong man. We got the right man. A man who now will do anything to get out of the justice that 10 good men and women and true meted out to him in 1989. She says that Leo, a man who was offered the chance to walk out of jail 30 years ago in exchange for testimony against his father, a man who turned down Aguero's second-degree murder plea deal that would have freed him from prison decades ago, She says this man, Leo Schofield, would do anything to get out of prison. And then she turns her attention to Andrew Crawford and Seth Miller, Leo's defense. She asks the judge to consider their motivations. Who's looking for truth here and who's just trying to win? You will know it when you see it. After Victoria Avalon takes 50 minutes to go after just about everyone in the courtroom with her opening statement, it's time to call the first witness. Mr. Miller, will you be calling the first witness? Yes, I will, Your Honor. Jeremy Scott, please. Jeremy Scott. Jeremy's escorted to the stand. He's handcuffed and wearing an orange jumpsuit. In most of the photos from the hearing, his head hangs down. He looks exhausted and frail. Hello, Mr. Scott. I I want to take you back to... Uh, February 24th, 1987, the day Michelle Schofield was murdered. Uh, do you recall having an interaction with Michelle, Michelle Schofield mis- that night? I made a statement to it on record court. I ain't got nothing else to say. I said everything I said is on record court. I, I'm telling the judge, I, what I said on the court is what's true. You'll answer the question, sir. I got nothing to say about this. 
The sooner you answer the questions, the sooner we'll be done, sir. All right, Laura, keep pulling me out of prison for this bullshit. Can I have him uh, declared as a hostile witness, Your Honor? Yes. Okay, thank you. Declaring Jeremy a hostile witness means Leo's attorneys can ask him leading questions. It's the difference between asking, where was Michelle Schofield when you approached her, and isn't it true that you approached Michelle Schofield at the gas station? Mostly, they're yes or no questions, so it isn't ideal for eliciting spontaneous answers. And it's something the defense was hoping they wouldn't have to do. After he's declared a hostile witness, Jeremy is still irritated, but he maintains the story he'd given Andrew Crawford on the phone and the story that had been recorded by Pat McKenna a week before this hearing. It's true that you stated in that um, interview that you approached Michelle Schofield at a gas station? That's what I said on that recorder, that's what I said. And that Michelle Schofield was using a payphone at the time that you approached her? Yes, sir. And that you were high on drugs that night? I was drunk. When I'm drugged, I was drunk. Yeah, right, I was drunk. And that you were drinking Thunderbird wine? Yes, sir. And that wine usually makes you violent, doesn't it? Yes, sir, it does. His answers are brief. Yes, sir. No, sir. But ultimately, he sticks to the story. He confirms that he had asked Michelle Schofield for a ride, but that he directed her to a makeout lake instead of the trailer park he'd originally asked her to take him to. He confirms that once they got back there, he pulled out a cigarette or maybe it was a joint, but that's when his knife fell out. He confirms it was a small hunting knife with a compass on the end, and that he'd taken it from his uncle's closet. And he confirms that when Michelle saw the knife, she panicked and started hitting him. He's cooperating, but barely. What did you do with the knife? I don't feel like going through all this again. It's already bad enough. It's all right, bad enough, all right? It's been 30 fucking years, all right? Let the thing go. I'm confessing to the murder. Man, it would didn't do it. I'll take a polygraph test on that. I just have some more questions. I don't have no more answers. Your Honor, you'll direct him to answer the question. It don't matter what the Honor says. I haven't heard the question. I don't question. care what you say. I haven't heard the question yet. Ask the question. Okay. I don't say everything I had to say. Did you stab her with the knife? I told you. I killed her. Jeremy confesses to killing Michelle. Then Seth begins to ask him about his interactions with prosecutor John Aguero. Jeremy acknowledges the strange meeting, the meeting that happened behind closed doors without any witnesses or recordings made. Jeremy says that during that meeting, John Aguero had promised him help with parole in exchange for his testimony about the stereo theft. Aguero allegedly told him he had influence with the parole board and could make things happen if Jeremy, quote, stuck to the story he'd been giving. Did Mr. Aguero help you come up with the testimony that you would give at the, at the 2010 evidentiary hearing in this case? Not really. He just... They stay to, to the fact what I've been saying, because I've been telling the truth about my palm print. There's nothing, nothing different about that. And the stereo, I did steal the stereo. The only thing I denied was killing Sco- Mrs. Schofield. Which was a lie back then. Yeah. Yeah. So Jeremy says Aguero told him to stick to his story about taking the stereo equipment. That was the truth. All Jeremy had to do was leave out the part about killing Michelle. Seth hands the witness over for cross-examination. Now it's the state's turn to ask questions. Victoria Avalon approaches Jeremy Scott. Mr. Scott. Yes, ma'am. My name is Victoria Avalon. I'm the prosecutor in the case. I've tried a couple times to reach out to Victoria Avalon. We've exchanged a few emails but she's made it clear that she prefers her cases to be argued in a court of law 
not the court of public opinion, as she's called it. I never really expected her to sit down with us, but of course I had to try. In her last email, she told me, it wouldn't bother me at all if you entirely ignored me in your reporting. And now, after listening to Avalon's questioning of Jeremy Scott, I know why she might want her work on this case ignored. Last week you talked to the defense investigator, Mr. McKenna, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. Avalon asked Jeremy about his medications and what he was on, if anything, at the time he spoke to Pat McKenna. Being transferred between institutions, and especially back to a county jail, can be incredibly disruptive. Any sort of medical or psychological treatment might not be continued from one facility to the next. At the time Jeremy gave his confession to Pat McKenna, he was off his meds and had been placed in a suicide cell. He's still off his meds when Victoria Avalon asked Jeremy about his movements between institutions, and Jeremy's getting agitated. His transfers have been so frequent, it's hard to keep them straight. And now he's back in the Polk County Jail, where the conditions are terrible. Y'all calling me out for this again? I'm not calling you out. Well, I'm here, and I'm going to be in this county jail in a site cell. On a cold floor, eating with my fingers, <laughs> waiting to go back to my camp. Let's get back to my question, Mr. Scott. Sure. You gave two statements to my investigators. One was a Avalon grills Jeremy about all the times he'd previously denied killing Michelle Schofield. And as her cross-examination goes on, she gets loud and more aggressive. But you're still never getting out. And you know that, right? You can die behind chain link, right? Objection. Asked and answered. Sustained. Your grandmother's dead, right? We should leave her out of this. Your grandmother's dead, right? Yes, she is. When? Recently. When recently? A couple of years. She was the only one on earth that cared about you, wasn't she? You Got to answer out loud. Yeah. No one's sending you any money, correct? No, ma'am. This whole courtroom full of people, nobody's here for you, are they? No, ma'am. You can't even afford to buy deodorant, can you? No, ma'am. You got to get money somehow, right? Yes, ma'am. Canteen ain't free, is it? No, ma'am. No pride industry for you. It seems that Avalon is doing whatever she can to go after Jeremy's credibility. It's as if she's saying, look, he's a pathetic person, he's unstable, and he'll do anything to get a little money or a little attention, even confess to a murder he didn't commit. And she points out all the times that Jeremy has given inconsistent statements under oath. The judge will have to grapple with this. In order to accept that Jeremy Scott is telling the truth about Michelle Schofield's murder, He'll need to acknowledge that Jeremy has previously lied under oath numerous times. So Avalon is basically asking, how can we possibly know which version of Jeremy's story is the truth? She's saying, we can't. So Jeremy's confessions should be disregarded. You don't know? You took the oath right before you started testifying, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. You took the oath before you started testifying back in 2010, didn't you? Why are you bashing me? That's not my question. My question is, you took the oath today, and you took the oath before you testified in 2010, right? Now I just want to go back to my cell. Jeremy just begged to be sent back to his cell, the same cell where he's sitting on a cold floor and eating with his fingers. He'd rather be there than here with Avalon. The judge tries to rein her in. Well, we ain't gotten started yet. Ms. Avalon. Yes, sir. That wasn't a question. Then Victoria Avalon starts getting into specifics about the violent stabbing. She's asking Jeremy to demonstrate how he held the knife and whether he first stabbed Michelle in the face or in the chest. Jeremy says he was drunk and he doesn't know. Can you take a look at this, Mr. Scott? Exhibit 52 at trial. Look at it. 
I haven't seen it before. See it again. Badgering the witness, Judge. Sustained. Avalon is holding up one of the photographs from Michelle's autopsy. One of the photos we saw in the evidence room. They're hard to look at. And Jeremy doesn't want to look. Is this what you did to her? No. I didn't hear that answer. No, I didn't do that. No, I didn't do that. Victoria Avalon lets Jeremy's response hang in the air and decides to wrap up her cross-examination. Now, Seth Miller re-examines Jeremy Scott, and he uses his time to clarify Jeremy's response to Avalon. What? You were in a haze when you killed Michelle Scofield, is that correct? Yes. So, I mean, you don't remember how many times you stabbed her, <clears throat> correct? You don't remember every single time you stabbed her, correct? You don't remember every location that you stabbed her in, is that correct? Yes, sir. You just know that you stabbed her? Yes, sir. With that hunting knife with the compass on it, correct? Yes, sir. And you feel ashamed of doing it, don't you? Yes, sir. That's why I didn't want to look at the picture. That's why you gave that answer to Miss Avalon, is that correct? I killed her. After the hearing, local reporters would fixate on Jeremy's words. Not, I killed her, but I didn't do that. This line, taken out of context, would come to define the hearing. One headline read, quote, Inmate recants his murder story. Susie Shottlecotty, the Lakeland Ledger reporter who'd been covering the case for 28 years, also believes that Jeremy recanted. I mean, it was, it was subtle, but it was, you know, he crumbled like a cheap suit. Even after Jeremy confessed multiple times on the stand, a recantation was the lasting impression on reporters. But listening to the recordings of this hearing, it's clear to me that Jeremy Scott did not recant. Jeremy's words came after nearly two hours on the stand, two hours of standing handcuffed before a judge, answering questions, and having his words and his life scrutinized. And that's when Jeremy is confronted by the picture from Michelle's autopsy. It was Victoria Avalon's final attempt to provoke him. This picture was taken after Michelle's body had been submerged in water for nearly three days. She was laid out on the autopsy table under the harsh lights. Her wounds had been cleaned, and the damage the knife had done was clearly visible. That's what Jeremy was seeing when he said, no, I didn't do that. But for me, it's something else Jeremy says. His words at the end of the hearing that still haunt me. I killed her. Bone Valley is a production of Lava for Good podcast in association with Signal Company No. 1. Our executive producers are Jason Flom and Kevin Wordis. Kara Kornhaber is our senior producer. Britt Spangler is our sound designer. Roxandra Guidi is our editor. Fact-checking by Maximo Anderson. Our producer and researcher is Kelsey Decker. Our theme song, The One Who's Holding the Stars, is performed by Lee Bob and the Truth. It was written by Leo Schofield and Kevin Herrick in Florida's Hardy Correctional Institution. Bone Valley is written and produced by me, Gilbert King. You can follow the show on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Lava for Good. To see photos and documents from our investigation and exclusive behind-the-scenes content, visit lavaforgood.com slash bonevalley.com.